so metaprogramming in C sharp. So presume everyone here seems it's .NET North C sharp, F sharp. Yep. Excellent. Cool. Not going to explain any of those things then. Um, we live in a world where our tools and frameworks and libraries are often built for us, especially in .NET. We rely on ASP and MVC, DI containers, unit testing tools, IDEs, all of this stuff that hums around our ecosystem that we don't really think about, we just kind of benefit from. Um, these tools are really, really popular because they solve what people see as the hard problems. You know, oh God, it's really hard to write web frameworks, it's hard to write DI tools, so we have a couple of them and all of a sudden we kind of settle on one and we just get on with it. In this session, what I want to do is explain how all these big tools and frameworks work and explain how they're really not any different from user land code. They're not any different from the application code you write. They're built using the same languages, the same techniques as everything you do in your day-to-day -day job. What we're going to do is we're going to break down how they work. MVC, test frameworks, containers. We're going to illustrate how it's all really just metaprogramming, reflection, and hopefully leave you with some practical tips of implementing some of these things in your own code bases to make your code a little bit easier to use. So that's me. Um, I don't have very much to say about me. I'm a reprobate. Um, I've worked with some very, very large companies and I'm riding on the coattails of my former glories, um, like everybody else, really. I used to be the chief technical architect of uh, the company Just Giving, the charity fundraising platform. Did some work with Just Eat, a whole lot of stuff in publishing. But the, the thing all those jobs had in common is they were all big web scale .NET things, especially at a time when people were very, very happy to say, oh, .NET doesn't scale, oh, it's not fast enough. Absolutely is, absolutely did. Um, that's my favorite photo of myself, I think. Um, that was 0 to 151 rum drunk in about 10 seconds after snorkeling in the Caribbean. That was my face of disbelief. And I've used it ever since in a professional capacity because I'm that much of a professional. So let's talk about metaprogramming. Anyone know what this is? There we go. Not only a great death metal song, but uh, an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or a dragon eating its own, own tail. It originates from the Greek language ura, meaning tail, and boros, meaning eating, thus he who eats the tail. It symbolizes self-reflexivity, introspection, or cyclicity, especially in the sense of something constantly recreating itself, the eternal return. And in code, that's basically reflection. So, um, so let's see what Wikipedia says metaprogramming is before we actually talk about it. So metaprogramming is the writing of computer programs with the ability to treat programs as their data. It means that a program could be designed to regenerate, analyze, or transform other programs, or even modify itself while running. <gasps> In some cases, this allows programmers to minimize the number of lines or code to express a solution, hence reducing the development time, or it gives programs greater flexibility to efficiently handle the situations without recompilation. The language in the metaprogram is written is called the meta language, and the language of the programs that are manipulated are called the object language. The ability of a programming language to be its own meta language is called reflection. I don't know who writes this shit, honestly, like, Really? I mean, they're right. It's an accurate description of metaprogramming. Fucking mouthful. So, in plain English, reflection is all about writing code that looks at the metadata of your program at runtime. The metadata in C Sharp is generally the list of available types, interfaces, um, your application domain, the names and details of your methods, the properties on your types. And in C Sharp, to do this, we use the reflection API to metaprogram. So that's all the methods that hang off the namespace system reflection. Hands up if you've used that namespace before. Like, quite common, something you always stumble into. Um, so how about if you've knowingly used reflection rather than just seen it? That's so much people, that's good. How about people that have done a lot of metaprogramming in, in an, any other language? JavaScript, maybe? OK, interesting. So. Let's look at a really, really quick example of metaprogramming. Be prepared. Really, really hard stuff. Super difficult. Super difficult. Um, I say example because, I mean, here's a screenshot that I made earlier, about a year ago. Um, because sometimes there aren't enough willing bodies to sacrifice, and I'm not going to demo any of this stuff live. I'm not that stupid. Um, so this is just about the simplest example of metaprogramming in C Sharp that I can possibly imagine. The fun thing about it is you've literally seen this all the time. There is nothing interesting or clever or exciting about this. 
Whenever you use the getType method exposed on every single object in C-sharp, you're using metaprogramming to ask the .NET runtime for the type definition of the object you're calling getType from. So I'm going to say the word type about 300 times in this talk. I'm really, really sorry. Um, so from this type information, you can start to navigate the current application domain. You can retrieve information about everything loaded inside of it. These two examples il here illustrate how using any type at all, you can grab a list of all the other types in the current assembly. And how from a single type parameter, you can list all the available methods you have on that type. So there's really nothing difficult, interesting, or scary about this. The 101 really is that simple. And the funny thing about metaprogramming is, and especially reflection in C-sharp, it has a really, really interesting reputation for being a mixture of slow, eh, kind of true, maybe in .NET 1.1 days, and difficult and dangerous. And it really is none of those things. So let's talk about why that is metaprogramming. So the type, type, in C Sharp is a way of inspecting the type metadata of an application while it's running. So if you're using the type type, your metaprogramming is supported by the type system of the CLR. Um, it's metaprogramming because you're writing code inside your program that inspects its own state at runtime. And like we mentioned before, that's called reflection. And if you're wondering how the type is, re is related to the reflection API, you only actually need to look at the inheritance hierarchy of the type type. System.type inherits from system reflection member info. So every time you use type anywhere in your code, you are unknown to you doing some kind of metaprogramming because you're doing inspection of your own code at runtime. It's part of the reflection API. So the type type is useful. You've seen it before, even if you didn't realize. And the reason we're starting with this type is because it's one of the more common parts of the runtime that touches metaprogramming, and pretty much everyone that's ever used generics or type constraints has probably seen it. And you know, maybe if I've said, hey, have you used generics in like 2007, people might have looked at their toes a little bit, or 2005. In 2018, everybody understands generics is working in .NET, like this is not scary stuff. Um, so type in C Sharp offers an API for type inspection, and by using it and the methods it makes available, you can do things like list all the properties on a type, list all the methods on a type, list, get a list of all the available constructors on a type along with their parameters, get and set values on a type, check if a type is abstract, get and set members that are hidden from you due to access modifiers, and most importantly, you can create an instance of that type. Um, so how many of you come across Activator before? Okay, cool, we're gonna go through an example of that about 10 times in a bit. Um, Interestingly, does anyone know of any way in C Sharp to create an instance of a type without calling its constructor? Go on, curious. Uh, reflection yes, that, not the answer I was going for, amazingly, but yes, you can, you can do that. So interestingly, there's another supported API where you can make instances of types buried in the .NET 1.1 XML serialization code. There's a method, I forget what it's called, it's something like create uninitialized member and you can create instances that completely allocate the memory for a type and skip everything in it. Super, super dangerous, never touch it, never use it, except that one time when it's really useful and you desperately want to. Um, super weird. So type is one part of a rich meta model. Thank you, Wikipedia. Yeah, 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 cool. Thanks, computer scientists, um, something like that. So. Of course it is, of course it's part of a rich meta model. The concept of a meta model has a lot of scientific language around it, but in this case, what meta model means is nothing more than obviously the model of your model. So in the case of C Sharp, the meta model is a series of types that describes the types and data structures of the application currently in memory. So you can spot the C Sharp meta model at a distance because all of the type names of the meta model look the same pretty much member info, property info, method info, type info, parameter info, event info, field info, constructor info, method body, because why on earth would we want consistency, method base, of course, and local variable info. So they're all the C-sharp meta model, and using the reflection API, you end up dealing with those types, and then writing code to react to the values in the instances of them returned to you when you inspect other things in your code. Um, so generally, you use the reflection API from 
starting at the current type or the application domain or somewhere in your code and you navigate around all these properties of the meta model. So, God. But we've seen how the type class is part of the C sharp reflection meta model, but let's look at a real simple practical example of doing something useful using metaprogramming. So this is about the most trite example I can possibly concoct. Um, so we're using the C-sharp reflection APIs here to get all the assemblies in the current application domain on the first line. And then we grab the type of each one of them before printing the name of the type to the screen. I mean, it's kind of useless, but it is something real. Um, there's nothing remarkable whatsoever about this code sample, but that's a, a practical piece of metaprogramming. And we'll come back to this example later and I'll show you how you can actually do something vaguely useful with something that simple. So let's pretend I'm actually running Visual Studio and if I ran it, you'd get something like this. You get a lot of stuff that you didn't even realize was in your app domain that the CLR hoists into every application when it starts up. Um, but yeah, it worked. Yes, it did. So obviously, if this wasn't a slide deck, I'd be able to scroll through here and you'd eventually be able to find some useful application types. But Otherwise, that's basically what an application domain looks like. Uh, I must have done these slides when they were trying to vote in Trump. Irony. Um, so here's the interesting thing. Metaprogram is the glue that holds everything that you use together. All the libraries and frameworks that you use are literally stuck together with metaprogramming. Some of it's built into the runtimes, like ASP.NET. So how do you think web stuff works? there's some DLL somewhere on a disk and there's a web server and all that stuff has to be glued together with code somewhere. Um, a lot of it is the glue in these frameworks that you use every day. NUnit, XUnit, nHibernate, Entity Framework, Nancy, Mock, all of these things make use of the Reflection APIs and as a result are all baked around metaprogramming. So not only is it useful to understand how those tools work, but how you can apply those same practices inside of your own code. So let's take a look into some examples of how actual things work so we can understand the value of metaprogramming in our code bases. Okay, test frameworks. Should we write our own test framework? Why not? Like, not that hard, surely. So has anyone ever written a test framework before? Foolish man. <laughs> no, uh, of course. Uh, anyone ever written a test runner? Maybe more common. Interesting. So test frameworks are the archetypical example of libraries that are literally just metaprogramming. There's basically nothing else to a test framework. Um, so if I said, hey, let's go away and write a test runner for n unit tests right now, do we think we could do it? Yeah, I think we probably can. So what do test frameworks actually do? So Right? They, they look for stuff. They, they scan for code. So n unit, x unit, attribute based stuff. So there's some attributes. They, they try and find them. And then they run your code. And then they see if it failed or not. So without digging into the example, it just sounds like scanning some assemblies, calling some methods, and wrapping them in a giant try catch. And that's actually not too dissimilar from what test frameworks really do in the real world. Um, so this is one of my favorite examples because I run it as a code dojo and um, I, I often run it with grads because they're the most scared of this and I say hey we're gonna write a test framework in uh, an hour and 20 minutes and they look at me like I've just like kicked their dog and I'm about to burgle their mother's house um, but it's not that hard so let's let's take a look at test best tests ever um, so what I've done here is I borrowed the end unit syntax that's not an end unit test. I just made an attribute called test fixture, and an attribute called test. There's nothing end unit about it other than its convention. Um, test frameworks provide you with a trivial pattern to instrument your code. So we've, has anyone not written a unit test before? Thank fuck, 2018. Um, it's good, it's like a question for once every talk, and every year it got better and better and better until everyone finally worked it out. Um, so you mark up your, tests using attributes like test and test fixture. And then a test runner executes them and captures the results. All the mainstream.NET frameworks are slightly different in their form, but almost identical in their function. Um, they all detect tests. In NUnit's example, looking for test fixture. 
and test methods contained inside of them, they execute them, and they report success or failure. They're nothing more than programs that find code and run methods. Awesome. There is actually a subtle difference, actually, between X unit and an N unit. Anyone know what it is? It's the unit of isolation. So in, in N unit, one instance of your class gets created for every test that runs inside of it, which is why things like setup methods and parallelization of tests can screw up local variables. Actually kind of bad. X unit, single instance of the class per every test run. It's the only difference. So N unit basically gives you the shotgun you can point at your legs. Um, irony, the people that wrote X unit were also the people that wrote N unit and somehow they managed to cock it up so badly that they wanted to do over in their test framework so they completely started again. Um, just really for that one bug fix at first. Kind of funny. So, there's, there's, a, there's a test runner. Why not? So, test frameworks have four core concerns. Code discovery, code execution, assertion, and rules gathering and reporting. So, let's just express these concepts in C-sharp. So, there's absolutely nothing behind any of these methods at all. I just made some classes and gave them some names. Um, it's just a sketch. We've not implemented anything. Um, so let's say we have a class that finds things, a class that executes things and catches exceptions, and something that reports results. This main method is the backbone of our test runner executable. That's just a console app. Cool. So let's do some discovery using metaprogramming. So look at how we use metaprogramming to take care of the four core concerns of a test runner. We, we're going to even make it run end unit tests as well, not just my fake test framework. We'll make it run the real thing. Why not? Our finder is incredibly simplistic. It just reads the name of a DLL passed over the command line as the first argument, loads it into memory upon construction, and then uh, once we have the random DLL full of junk in our app domain, we use some reflection APIs to find some tests. So in the real world, all of the test runners do some crazy remoting thing where they generate app domains that they put the tests in, but honestly, it's just a test runner, who cares? Get you there. Um, so, all this really is, single line from an assembly, getting the assembly name from the, the command line, loading it into memory, and we've got a test DLL stored in a, a member field. So let's take a look at our find tests. Oh my god. Holy link, Batman. Um, but that's fine, it's actually not that bad. Let's take a look at the three statements we have here, because there's really only three things we're doing. First, finding all the possible test fixtures. So from the DLL, we're going to get all the types where any of the custom attributes name starts with test fixture. Ho, ho, ho. There's end unit compatibility in one magic string. Then we're going to get all the methods by taking all those test fixtures we've detected and getting all the public instance methods from those types. And then we're just going to return a list of anything in there where the type name starts with test, because hey, who cares? <laughs> Why not? So. So we're, we're first we're filtering on fixture, test fixture attributes, then we're selecting public methods, and then we're returning anything with a test attribute off the top of it. Really, really not very difficult. And not very slow, and not likely to be buggy, unless a unit goes and renames their attributes to something stupid. Like, I don't know, fact, theory, something like that. Um, okay. See, so I don't need any of these notes anymore. So let's take a look at our test executor. So we're going to execute some code using reflection. So we've got a class that can load a DLL. We've got a class that can uh, take that DLL and select methods we want to run. Um, so this, this is Activator. A couple of people in here, like half the room, said they, they'd seen Activator before. So it's one of the more tedious and obtuse classes in the framework because it, like, it doesn't take generic parameters and it kind of looks like a piece of crap and it takes a load of objects as a parameter. The API is horrible. But that's the joy of using statically typed languages to do something kind of dynamic. But, you know, it's Activator. Whenever you see Activator, you know it's a pain in the ass. You just get, get on with your life and use it. Um, it lets you make classes. It'll pass on constructor parameters and return you an instance of the type. That's all it does. So all we're doing here is passing the type from the method info that we've selected from our test. So the method info just describes those methods we found with test attribute written on the top. And we're saying, make me one. Thank you, CLR, make me one. Call the default constructor, make me one. 
So actually, this is the X unit pattern here. We're deviating from X unit because to run us test safely, we're just creating a fresh instance of our type every time. And then all we're doing is we're calling invoke on the new instance that we, we just created. So that method info is basically a, a, a descriptor, some metadata pointing to a method in a type definition. That is not an instance of the type. Activator gives us an instance of the type, and then using that method info, we say, hey, this, this effectively pointer you've got here, on that type, please execute this method. And then all we're doing is we're, we're, we're calling our test result dot pass test method if that line of code gets by. We don't really care about anything else. We're just saying, I, got, I managed to invoke the test. I didn't crash. Let's presume success. Um, if an exception is thrown, we return fail. So let's, let's take a, a, a wild guess here. Maybe this metaprogramming thing actually isn't as complicated as you've heard. Um, there's nothing sophisticated here. We just strung together a couple of methods. And uh, let's take a quick look at the, uh, the test result, uh, the test reporter class even, because I think you might find it really, really interesting. There's, there's something really significant we have to do here. Yeah, um, that's basically what NUnit's console runner does. We're done, right? <laughs> like, this class just takes a look at our result, and if there's an exception, writes an X to the console. Like, that's literally good enough to plug into a Team City server and add a build failure condition on the occurrence of the letter X. It would actually just work. So, if we jump all the way back to here, we now, we fleshed out a finder, we fleshed out our executor, we fleshed out our reporter. So obviously, fully featured test frameworks have loads of other concerns, um, but it's core, cool. this is literally how they all work. You notice we've not really discussed assertions at all. And for the sake of brevity, <laughs> I'm just going to say assertions are basically out of scope of most of your test frameworks. Um, they're not really important. You could write a bunch of if statements and throw errors if you liked. Um, there are tons of assertion libraries out there. Most test frameworks come with whatever the favorite syntactic pattern of the author of that test framework happened to put in at the time. Uh, sometimes it's a bit fluent. Sometimes it's you know, the classic end unit assert that, and they tend to change over time. But the way you run your tests are the same regardless. Um, so. We're going to consider writing an assertion library completely out of scope here. That's it. Works. So the difference between this and any other real test framework is that there's really nothing to them other than framework detection. And it's funny, I've just kind of said a test framework is about 100 lines of code, and then you go and you check out the end unit source code, and it's got like 15 projects in there. Has anyone ever looked at the NUnit source code? It's a marvel. It's like a historical um, archaeology trip through the history of .NET. Because you can see it supporting all the different versions of the framework. You can see like, the Windows, like, Windows CE builds of the test runner that used to run on old school Windows mobile phones. There's like UWP versions of the NUnit runner that can run in like sandboxed apps and things like that. Actually quite sophisticated. But at its core, all of that stuff, all that dynamic loading, is wrapped around a very, very, very simple and very, very small thing. There's not really any magic. They just use reflection to detect cases, create classes, execute them, and check for exceptions. So there's a little bit more complexity in a lot of in some test frameworks. So you've got some state, so you've got setup and teardown. But if you actually think about what we just saw, executing a setup and teardown function is nothing more than searching for a function called setup and teardown and calling it before and after each test. It's not any more complex than what we've just shown. The, the, you know, the, the actual language and the runtime takes care of all the heavy lifting. It's not like the test framework has to track state or anything like that. So let's, let's think about MVC frameworks. Anyone get the visual pun? What happens to all MVC frameworks? You end up with fat controllers. Hmm. Grown, grown, dad jokes for days, and don't have kids. <laughs> So, <clears throat> let's invoke Wikipedia again because I love it. Model view controller. Use my theater voice. Mod MVC is a software architectural pattern, mostly but not exclusively implemented in user interfaces on computers. 
it divides a given software application into three interconnected parts so as to separate internal representations of information from the ways that information is presented to or accepted from the user. Good, good pros. Traditionally used for desktop graphical user interfaces, the architecture has become extremely popular in designing web applications. Said nobody ever. Um, I presume, does anyone not, has anyone not used an MVC framework before? Cool. Thank God. Um, MVC has kind of ruined web architecture. There's a, there's a pub argument for you later. Um, models, views, and controllers. So there's nothing particularly special about MVC at all. It's really just a pattern for organizing your code with a couple of defined responsibilities. Anything that's just a pattern is perfect for metaprogramming because really what metaprogramming is is all about writing code that detects patterns. Um, so we're going to look at ASP.NET MVC as a specific example. So MVC simplified. So how was MVC written? Does anyone remember the, the myth around it? So MVC, the, the, as, as the story goes, it was a conversation between a couple of the Scots and Scott Guthrie cracked out the first version of it on a plane to mix in Vegas one year in like a three hour flight. And I actually kind of believe him. I, I, it's not actually true. It's a gross oversimplification of how it was written, but the first cut for a demo happened at mix once, um, as the legends go. So MVC is a library that calls user code, much like test frameworks. So what does it do? It, it binds HTTP to code. It takes an incoming HTTP request and inspects the requesting URL. Based on that URL, it finds a controller that matches a root. So you've got two pieces, a controller and a root, and it selects the most appropriate method on that controller to execute, and it does. So kind of like finding a test from an assembly and finding a test method and running it. Very, very similar. Um, it grabs the output of that method, the model, and passes it into a view engine. The view engine takes the model and returns something, normally HTML, unless there's some kind of content negotiation plugged in at the end of it, and then it can be formatted in different ways. So there's plenty of nuance in there that we've left out. Of, you know, the real MVC framework itself is much more sophisticated, especially in version you know, 300 or whatever in now. Um, but in the first version of MVC, it was nothing more than this at all, because it was written on a plane. So. MVC was built on top of ASP.NET originally, and its life, it started out as little more than a HTTP handler that processed requests. So has anyone ever implemented a HTTP handler before? Okay, actually, quite a, quite a small number. You're, you're lucky because it's kind of tedious down here in the weeds in ASP.NET, um, certainly in the full fat framework pre.NET Core. Um, so <coughs> HTTP handlers and HTTP modules before them are the lowest level of hooks that you can use to, build, uh, to host a website in IS. Um, so this is a basic handler, which does nothing more than write hello to the response stream every time a request hits that handler. Um, and we're going to look at how we can take this and turn it into a, an implementation of a micro MVC framework. So the way um, HTTP handlers work is you literally have one line of configuration in an app, a web config file, point everything to this, every single request to this, and every time you request your hosted website, you'll just get hello written out. Completely, completely trite. Nothing interesting there. So much like we did with the test framework, I want to sketch out metaprogramming bound to HTTP. So we can start out by looking at the first thing, which is that when our handler is constructed, it finds all the assemblies in the current app domain, and then gets all the types, and then finds anything where the name ends with controller. And you know that's a really, really ghetto, ghetto implementation of, of MVC's type scanning. But I'll tell you what, it works, right? Your controllers probably end with the name controller, and that'll find all of them in any assembly. You can, all those nice features of MVC where you can have areas and things and separate off all the controllers, one line. Zero tests. Um, lol. So, it's a simplistic approach, but it'll do for now. We're going to cache all of those controller types into a list called controllers, so we can easily refer to them without using reflection when we receive requests. So like I said earlier, reflection is really not very slow, but it is an order of magnitude slower than not using reflection. 
So if we can avoid doing a big, deep assembly type scan on every request, we should. Um, and then we're going to take a look at our process request method here. So process request does nothing more than pick a controller, passing in the HTTP context, the same context you have everywhere else, pick some method, creates an instance, invokes the instance, and writes a response. Very, very, very simple MVC pipeline. So this is all really eerily familiar. We've got a method based on a context picking controllers. Let's take a look at how pick controllers should probably be implemented. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, this is simplistic as well. And it's funny how small it is. Every time, I kind of amuse myself every time I see how trite this stuff really is. MVC is a good example of metaprogramming being used to bake conventions into a framework. And actually, one of the things that excited a lot of people when MVC hit was the fact that, oh, it all just kind of worked. You know, web forms were such a drag for so many years that just the fact you could drop, drop a single file in and a single ASPX page and do nothing and everything just kind of work based on the name shouldn't have been a revelation, but it was. I mean, I don't know, have, have any of you guys ever done any Rails? It's fine. <laughs> I feel so guilty about it. Yeah, me. We owe everything to Rails. Modern web dev owes Rails everything. Without Rails, we wouldn't be where we are today, even though Rails today is like Rails 20 Super Enterprise Edition with 20,000 security vulnerabilities and no scale. Rails completely changed the way everybody built the things for the web. You know, without Rails, there'd be no SBNet MVC, there'd be no Nancy, there'd be probably no Owen, there'd be no Drop Wizard in Java, there'd be no Sinatra in Ruby. All of these things were reactions to or inspired by Rails and, and the thing that Rails really did well was sensible defaults for everything. Um, so as time has gone on, MVC itself has become more configurable and the hard-coded defaults have given way to more complex configuration, but we're going to go with simple as best for this. So remember all those controllers we detected when our module first started up? Well, we're going to use them here. We're going to use the wonderfully hacky trick of just saying, find me the first controller where the name matches the start of the URL. Because, hey, why not? Simple. Um, obviously, you want some more sophisticated detection heuristics here in the real world, but it'll do for our example. So then with a null check, we're going to grab any controller called home controller if we find nothing, effectively implementing the default route from MVC. Otherwise, we're going to return the one we found. So, I mean, that is so astronomically simple. And really, that's, that's, the, that's all a root table really does. So add in a regular expression and a list, and you have a root table. Real simple. So let's take a look at picking the method. We're doing the same kind of things here. We're going to use a call to get methods with some binding flags to find all of our controller classes and the methods inside them, and then match against the incoming path and query string. Um, much, uh, much like how we had a default home controller in the controller picker, we're going to have a default index action if no, if no action method is found. So we take the URL, we look at all the public instance methods, we get them all, we find the first one where it contains the method name. If there is one, we return it. If not, we default it to index. That's it. That's simple. And as a result, Jumping back to our module again, you'll see there's, there's really, really little to it. We pick a controller, we pick a method, we just invoke it and return the result. We're going to create an instance and then invoke it. So there's, the observant of you might notice that there's a missing bit here. This is not a full MVC implementation at all. We're missing a model binder, which lives at the top, which would basically sit here that maps things from the context into some kind of class or shape that we can pass as a parameter to our method. That's fine. That's the same kind of thing again. We find all the properties on a model that we specify, and we find anything that matches in the HTTP request. We make an instance, and we set all the values. And we're missing a view engine that transcodes this response into something else. So the funny thing is, we could take this, and we could use, say, the Razor view engine from actual MVC, and just pass the response to the Razor view engine with the name of a view file, and it would still work. 
Um, but while we'll need those bits for real MVC framework, ironically, this is actually enough to build a ghetto clone of Web API, which doesn't really have many of those concerns. So you can easily see how the model binder would fit in. So imagine we had one of those, and we had a directory structure that looked like that, a foo controller and a home controller. Um, cool. And then we have a web config that says any single request on any single verb, just just pass it to me. Thanks. That's real code. Just works. Like it shouldn't really be that simple, but actually it, it's good that it is. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to dig deeply into the missing parts of the MVC framework. So maybe I was being a bit disingenuous when I said an MVC framework was like a hundred lines of code. Um, but the model binding is little more than mapping query string parameters into DTOs. And um, through these two examples, it's just startling how similar building a test runner and building an MVC framework really is. So the backbone of metaprogramming is using your meta model to inspect your code and then usually construct and invoke functions inside of it. So we've got one remaining example, which is a minimal IOC container in a single class. I've kind of got two more things to talk about, really. One of them's a final example, and uh, the, the next set is a bunch of um, tips and tricks that you can bring into your own code bases. So, IOC containers. Has anyone not used an IOC container before? Okay, cool, so we've got one over here. Do you know what an IOC container is? Perfect, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the Wikipedia joke again, just to get through, um, but that's, that's, that's cool. So, so what Wikipedia says, if we invoke it, is uh, in software engineering, inversion of control is a design principle in which custom written portions of a computer program receive the flow of control from a generic framework. A software architecture with this design inverts control as compared to traditional procedural programming. In traditional programming, the custom code that expresses the purpose of the code, wow, calls into reusable libraries to take care of generic tasks, but with the with inversion of control, it's the framework that calls into the custom, uh, to the custom or task specific, oh, this is garbage, garbage. I'm gonna go home, I think, and edit these Wikipedia definitions to not suck so hard. Um, so basically, IOC containers, you ask them to give you your components so you can use them in your code, often using some magic things that happen, auto wiring or other framework level magic, and they give you instances of your code to execute. So the core of a super simple container without any posh features. So when I say posh features, I mean object scoping, I mean life cycle control, clever dependency rules is little more than that. A method to create any old type and then some kind of method to register type mappings. So let's look at how we can build this trivial sketch into a working container. So has anyone ever built a container before or something like it? You've done all the horrible things. <laughs> I feel so sorry for you, me too. It's like my own existential crisis. Um, so, so we have a container. It has a, a dictionary, a create, a non-generic create, a select type, and a for interface. So let's, let's drill down into a couple of these. So what we've got here, is a dictionary of simple mappings. What do I mean by that? That's, I mean, it's, it's not a very good uh, data structure. It just says, for this type, give me this type. And then we have a, a method called for that we can call from our user line code, where you pass it an interface type and an instance type, and it'll just stuff it in the dictionary. Very, very simple. So as I said, the container has no features, so you can only put one thing in there for any given interface. And it returns this, so you can chain your calls to four. And it's got a register method. And, sorry, it doesn't have a register method. The register method in your code would use it in, in this kind of way. So it would new up a container, and then it'd say, four, I my thing, register my thing. Brilliant. So, there's nothing more to a container than that. We're going to pretend. And then, uh, that's kind of it. Really, really creepily. So let me work through this slowly. So we're going to use a few bits of the reflection API we've not seen yet here. So firstly, for the type that we are asking to create, our T at the top, we're going to get all of its constructors. And then we're going to be sneaky and find the one with the biggest constructor. 
So we're just gonna start by picking the first constructor and then iterate through. And if any of our constructors has more parameters in it, we'll select that. So that means that we will always provide the biggest dependency graph to our, uh, to our type when we create it. We then we create a new list of dependencies. For each parameter in the biggest constructor, we call select type with the parameter type. We create an instance of the dependency and we add it to our list. And then we invoke the constructor. So all we've done is we've, from a type, picked a big constructor, got a list of all the things and kind of called ourself again and again and again and again. Um, so this obviously is a recursive call, but all we're really doing is just repeatedly running that code. Let's take a look at how we're actually going to do select type because um, this is what method binding looks like in most containers. So this container is actually super magic. Um, it's auto wiring. So when you ask for a type, it just fucking works. Beautiful, actually. Or from the assembly that the requested type is in, we're just going to grab all the classes that implement it as an interface. Really, really simple. And uh, if we find nothing, we're going to throw an exception because there's no registrations. If we find one thing, we're going to select it as the type to create. And if there's more than one thing, we look at what the correct answer is in our little dictionary of simple mappings. That's the backbone of the simplest possible container you could possibly write. Um, it's like 70 lines of code and it actually works. I think that's kind of beautiful because there's lots and lots of places where you're building software and you know, maybe, maybe taking a dependency on a big framework or a big ISC container, maybe they don't target your platform yet if you're using a new version of net standard and you've got a favorite container, it just doesn't work. Or you're in a scary new world of Raspberry Pi and you've only got so much space on the thing and you don't want extra DLLs flying around or you're in dependency management hell. Writing something like this isn't actually a bad thing. It's not like it's hard to understand. It's basically two methods. And it just actually works. Super, super cool. Um, and there have been lots and lots of things that I've worked on in the past where people have had lots and lots of really, really tedious switch statements and codes. You know, if you've ever, anyone ever used the command pattern, for instance, and then had to manually register everything piece by piece by piece, this command to this handler, this command to this handler, it's garbage code. Like all it does is obfuscate the meaning of your application and what your application actually does. Something like this, while it takes more than two seconds to pass with your mind, actually you can delete hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, serves as the backbone for your application. Um, the interesting thing about containers though, and whenever I talk about containers, I always have to point this out. How many of you here have that one registration file with like 20,000 lines in it of stuff? Yeah. I feel so sorry for you guys. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. I think, <clears throat> I think there's a slide about this later, me complaining about this. So I'm going to move forwards. And if not, I'm going to come back to this point. <laughs> um, so the, the magic in here, though, is it's the same stuff, right? It's the same stuff we're using to build test frameworks, the same stuff we're doing to do MVC. Um, so let's talk about some non-framework or real-world examples. Oh, the real world. I've got really, really bad visual puns. So we've spoken about how big things work in the .NET ecosystem, but what about the thin end of the wedge? Where can you sensibly use metaprogramming today? So as a rule of thumb, metaprogramming should be used to do the right thing by default. That's, the, that's I suppose, the takeaway. Um, you've got to help your developers fall into a pit of success rather than a pit of failure. That's kind of the greatest benefit of metaprogramming. So let's, let's think about conventions in code. So how many of you have com a convention in your code base, just any convention at all? What kind of conventions? Uh, naming. Naming. So all controllers end in controller, all factories end in factory, something like that. Cool. So, so one of the most important things metaprogramming can do for a code base is help you implement strong conventions um, to increase predictability in your application. So it, it's all about taking away a category of stuff from your code. You use conventions to solidify and codify internal patterns in your application. So let's take a look at this very, very synthetic example. Anyone send emails in their applications? Like everybody, right? And we've all got the same bullshit amount of like horrible string templating code. Or maybe you're using Razor and you've got a load of files on the disk and it's all garbage. Like it's really all garbage and tedious. So, and it probably started off as something like this. It's like, oh, if email type is this, if email type is this, maybe you made it a switch statement because you're feeling really fancy. But in this synthetic example, 
I've got a nightly email and a daily email. I've got a daily template and a nightly template. And I've got like some mergey template thing that takes the type, smushes them together and returns them out. Cool. So we've all been here before, but those two if statements soon become 30th statements. And then marketing one, you know, 30 different variations on those 30. Now you have 90 if statements and this thing just grows and grows and grows. Um, so let's not think about the moment when someone typos on like the 300th time the word template to be like template and then all your production servers you have to have two directories with email templates in there and that's the shit that happens in all code bases and it takes you ages and ages to unpick or random runtime bugs. So we can use metaprogramming here to, to stop any of that junk happening in the first place. We can forcefully implement conventional approaches to template loading. So all that code can be reduced down to like that. So consider this. We've got some email strategies. Um, the available emails are made available as a collection. You could even calculate that using reflection and discovery if you wanted to. Find me all types that are inherit from email or, or end in email. Um, the type name of the email is always the name of the template. So those things can never drift away. Strong convention. There's no room for error. The template's location is always the same location. No room for error. And uh, there's no room for repetitive code. No one can make that thing now 20,000 lines long by just adding another template. We, by enforcing conventions like this and these patterns, you can, you can make your code more understandable to the next person down. And you know, conventions are the reasons that frameworks like MVC actually gain popularity. Like that's the whole reason MVC was was seen as nice. It was like, oh, I've got three folders, models, views, and controls. It just works. Simple. Nobody had to think about that. The fact that there was a load of magic metaprogramming happening under the hood was completely transparent to the user of the, of the API. Entire popular libraries exist that just do this thing. This is basically what Automapper is. It's a thing that does left to right, matching on name and type. Every ORM ever from SQL table name to data structure name, left to right. Auto wiring components. I knew I had a thing where I, I wailed on IOC containers. Um, I, I just cannot even, and I know so many people have container wire up because every company I've ever joined, I've always opened some program somewhere and opened the 900 line thing of bind foo to bar, foo to bar two, foo to bar three. And you've got to scroll down and, you, and as soon as someone gets a binding wrong, everything is broken and you don't know how and you basically just revert and try again. It's horrible. Always register by convention. So if I have a container, instead of doing that, I could just kind of do that. And that's a lot more complicated. It is a lot more complicated for each class in all of the assemblies and all of the types where the class is a class and it's not abstract, for each interface on that class, register every interface to that class. Oh God, that's scary. I don't want to head compile that. But that code can never grow. Whereas the other thing will definitely grow every time anyone makes a change or introduces a type. So it's worth taking that tiny, tiny little bit of intellectual overhead to solve a problem that's going to happen in the, in the future. It's about 1% more complex but you can just get on with your life and make software that works by introducing that tiny little pot of complexity. We can protect code quality with metaprogramming. So let's say you've, got one of, you've had one of those discussions with your team, right? Where every class of a certain category should follow a naming convention. Cool. So, so all your factories now have to end in the word factory. Cool, whatever. Um, I don't really care if that's the decision. It sounds a bit dumb to me, but sure, let, them, let it be. Everything's got to be called factory. So the thing about conventions is you should stick to them. Perfect. So here's the thing about soft conventions. They're always going to get broken 100% of the time. You know, there's this, there's this graph between predictability and error. Error always happens. You can never remove the chance of an error happening. You can only minimize the bad thing that happens when the error does happen. So. So they're going to get broken. So when Bob, who was ill the day that you decided all factories have to end in the name factory, um, 
when, when, when he sits there and he pulls his user story and he adds his own class without the factory suffix and people get really angry and sad. Um, people should never really get angry and sad about them and they should really get over themselves. But Bob should also do the right thing, right? Bob should follow the conventions. So it's not really a realistic expectation for people to just know all of the little decisions that you or your team came to at some random point in time. It's not possible. But you know what? With metaprogramming, you just make the code enforce this stuff. So consider this test here. So what this does is it gets all of the assemblies and all the types from the namespace where you put your factories and makes sure every name ends with factory. So just like that, if Bob tries to check in his shittily named factory and his build breaks and he fixes it before anyone even realizes what a colossal failure of a human being he is. But seriously, if, you, if any significant part of your code base uses metaprogramming, and this is important actually, this is almost the, the downside, you really need to have tests to cover it. As, as you start using conventions, these are soft things. We're introducing a category of runtime errors while we're solving a category of discovering and duplication errors. Because all this stuff isn't found by the compiler. By definition, metaprogramming is changing the way the program works at runtime. So your compiler isn't going to see this stuff unless you write like clever Roslyn inspectors or something, but I'm not that clever. So really, I just write tests because I can do that. Um, you're going to need them. So what's the point of this talk? Why? Why? So I put this talk together for a few reasons. So the reflection and by association metaprogramming has a reputation for being scary. And it really isn't, and you use it every single day. Maybe you only use the thin end of the wedge, but it's a useful tool in your arsenal to simplify your code bases. Reflection has a reputation for being slow. And this is kind of partly true. In .NET 1.1, it was really, really slow, and you probably shouldn't use it ever, other than one time when your application starts up. But we're not there anymore. All of the examples that we've looked at here, if they were to ever get slow, really, really trivial in-memory caches would make their performance near enough indistinguishable from any other approach. Um, you know, we, we looked at that when we looked at the HTTP uh, MVC clone, where we just cached the controllers at runtime because we didn't want to spider through every single assembly on the disk in our application namespace, uh, in our application domain, every single time a request came in. Nice and easy. Don't be scared. You don't need to be scared of this stuff. It, the performance isn't going to kill you. But the benefit in predictability in your code base of strong conventions and patterns rather than repetition and churn. You know, th think about metaprogramming as a way to um, stop all the hotspots in your code becoming hotspots. So there's a really good um, there's a really good book called Your Code as a Crime Scene, which talks about looking at code from kind of a forensic psychologist way of detecting hotspots and following the patterns of where bugs and bad things and errors are introduced. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in that book, particularly about detecting where the hotspots in your code are. So the hotspots in your code are the, the bits of your code that changes the most often where errors are most likely to be introduced. It's like it's almost, you can see as your software flows towards its, port, its point of bad internal architecture. Because if you're always modifying a thing, that thing is not probably the right thing for the job. It, it needs to be decomposed or changed or something else has to take that place. And a lot of the times when you start to apply metaprogramming to a situation, it normally replaces one of those hotspots and allows you to explode out the various places that you implement parts of those components and introduce conventions to replace them. Um, so it's important that you, you use this stuff in the right places to solve problems in your code base, not just because it's cool. Um, so it removes a whole category of tedious repetition that you'd otherwise have to endure and maintain. It's the backbone of ORMs, mappers, frameworks, the web. It's the glue that holds everything together. And I really want people to see the art of the possible because, frankly, loads of really cool stuff uses this. Super good. But, but you know, here's the warning, right? Metaprogram should always be used to make the obvious thing work, not to make the right thing totally not obvious. And that's the danger, you know. People will rightly criticize the overuse of metaprogramming as being too secret, too magical, too mystery. Um, and as an API designer, it's your responsibility to make them feel comfortable with it. So if you're designing libraries and frameworks, you've got to keep this in mind. So nobody ever complained about MVC because model view controller, three folders, model view controller. Like you don't need a manual for that. Nobody ever complained. They understood the magic. 
they knew how the sausage was made effectively. They could understand it even if they didn't know how it was glued together. But if you're a library author and you use metaprogramming, it becomes a vital tool. It helps you work out what kind of application is consuming your library, how to adjust to the different runtimes, loading in different components for different scenarios. You know, if you look at something like the Nancy web framework, has anyone used that? Okay, cool. Like Nancy's super cool, like basically pure dynamic web thing. It's a clone of Sinatra from Ruby. Um, but the great thing about Nancy is it just works. Like you basically don't have to type any code and it works. So it, it's often advisable to give people APIs that trigger the magic rather than the magic just occurring because that's confusing to people. So for instance, if we have a class called start on our library, our magic startup library, you probably want a, a, a method hanging off start called with default conventions. Simply by having that method in your API, it kicks the user in the head. And they're like, oh, there are some default conventions here. I wonder what the default conventions are. Maybe I should go and look up what the default conventions are. That's enough of a prompt to make your API discoverable. Um, if your start code just applied a bunch of conventions blindly that were not explicable and there was no sign that they were happening, effectively random behavior occurs and people get confused. Um, so as your code base that uses metaprogramming grows, what you tend to find is that all the conventions that seem like a great idea at the start that you baked into your application don't quite fit anymore. They change over time and that's okay. For every order of magnitude growth in your software, the way you build your software should probably change as well. That's totally cool. That's not defeat, that's success. Um, so in my experience, and especially if you look at something like ASP.NET MVC, people start with hard baked default conventions and then they quickly turn into builders which have methods like start default conventions or replace with your own, or replace with your own. So you start to expose the conventions for modification. Um, the way to win people's hearts and minds uh, is by giving people at least the illusion of control or giving them some signposts, really. Whereas magic libraries that just do stuff that's really weird and seemingly unobvious get criticized. If any of you have done any Java, the Spring framework gets a lot of criticism for loads of magic stuff happening. You just kind of, you put an interface on a thing and it changes the whole behavior of your application. And that's crazy. It's crazy because it's really, really not that obvious and it's hard to see. There's no obvious point of change. So when you're using this stuff, make sure that you kind of lead people by the hand when you implement your own conventions. Um, so I've shown you how things work hopefully enough to kind of whet your appetites and put some of the stuff in your own code bases, even if it's just to clean up your tests, to clean up your naming, to make sure some of the more tedious and repetitive code that you have can be reduced out. And I think that's my lot. Bang on an hour. Thanks. Cheers,